Good evening and welcome to the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamandunga Kumalo. We are today on episode 15 of the podcast and day 35 of the national lockdown. And of course, today is the last day of uh, level five and tomorrow will be level four lockdown. We might come back to level five, who knows? But today we'll be unpacking uh, what level four actually means. So the good, the bad and the ugly for agents, tenants and landlords for level four lockdown and helping us unpack um, what level four means for the property and different people in the property space. I'm joined this evening again by Silna Stein, who's the Managing Director of SSLR Incorporated. Good evening, Silna. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hi, so much. Thank you so much for having me again. And especially on the last day of uh, lockdown level five. In, remember a week ago, we just thought there was like lockdown and not lockdown. We yeah. learned so much. <laughs> Not so much. And I mean, and of course, we've seen that the implications to the different levels. Uh, we saw that the, the new regulations around what level four means have now been announced. And I think I'd like us to first look at the first contentious one, uh, which is, of course, around the movement of people. What does level four actually mean for uh, our ability to move or people's ability to move around? Yes, uh, I think that was the question on everybody's lips. And um, I think. Uh, the, the publication from government with the proposed suggestions around the levels caused great confusion, but it was necessary um, so people can give the input. And clearly it had, it had a huge impact. Um, I'm not a smoker, so I'm going to use the smoking as an example. Um, but everybody was very excited when the president said, OK, people can smoke. And the reason why that was changed in level four was because of public submissions. So there were about 2,000, more than 2,000 submissions that said, no, 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 please, uh, we should keep smoking out. And why I'm saying this is I think people had a bit of an impression that the, the levels as it was published, that would be the regulations. And I, I, I knew that it, it wouldn't be, uh, which is why I didn't say anything about the proposed levels other than let's wait for regulations. Um, this was the exact reason. And um, it's very interesting under the regulations, what we are seeing now is, is very clear. Um, I know there's still a lot of, uh, let's call it confusion, but I don't think it's confusion. It's just things still need to crystallize. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll talk about that in more detail, but the long and the short of level four is, Nobody should be moving. Everybody, please sit tight. Level four does make provision for mm -hmm. some movement, a once-off movement. Um, I don't know if you want to unpack it one, one type of movement at a time. I think, or, I think definitely this work best. Yeah, I think let's actually unpack it for a little bit because I know there's um, provisions for coming for returning. So if you are, for example, out of the province um, and some people are asking questions and these are even some of the questions from people at home. Um, if you're able to, for example, move house so move into a new apartment or change. So I think let's unpack the different ways that um, the, the provision or, or rather the different ways that we are able to move um, according to the provisions. Yes. So the first very real thing that everybody has to appreciate is personal movement is not allowed. Yeah. There are exceptions to the rule. The rule is nobody is moving. Everybody is staying home. So exceptions is obviously uh, now just personal movement. You're, you're allowed to go to the shop to go buy essential things. Now there's a little bit of expansion on that. You're allowed to go to work if you're an essential worker. There's some expansion on that right now. Yeah. These kind of things, the rest of the time, stay home and do not go out of your house. That's the standard rule. And the reason why this is the standard rule, guys, let's please appreciate the fact that the government has to do their very best to try and keep not just the people but the economy as safe as possible. And now I do appreciate that I'll, I'll probably um, <laughs> get a few unlikes on my Facebook page for this one. But, uh, but I think it's important to appreciate, guys, um, it's the virus that is causing this. It's COVID-19 that's causing the harm to our economy. It's 
government is doing their very best to try and keep everything afloat as much as we can while we are battling this such a weird thing because it can be compared to war and i do definitely when i talk to to my team uh, in SSLR, I always say, guys, remember it's war. Nobody in a war would tell you, oh, I wish I can go out and, you know, go get my hair cut. No, you're going to die because it's war. Um, yeah. we, currently with the virus, it's important to appreciate. Um, we can't see it, so it's weird. And we're all like, yeah, what is this? We need yeah. to stay home. So the exceptions on the actual physical move, the movement in accommodation, once again, you're not allowed to move. Exceptions is there is a once off window now to return to your residence. Guys, it's important to appreciate the word return here. The regulation specifically says return. Now, return. And that's a potential one, right? Because I think a lot of people, um, and, 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 and it's potentially up for abuse. I mean, on, on, on the one hand, there are people when we started lockdown who were in different parts of the country or different parts of town, and you thought, you know what, I could be in lockdown for 21 days in this particular household, that's fine. And then we had, you know, the two-week extension, and now we've got level four, which actually doesn't mean that it's the end of the lockdown. So you didn't uh, make provision to be in a particular household for such an extended period of of time but in the same breath it's very easy for people to think well if there are some people who are moving i.e returning perhaps this is my opportunity to then move house completely so i'm not necessarily returning somewhere i'm now going to especially because tomorrow is now the first of may so i might just think let me just go move into that new residence that i was actually supposed to move into on the first of april so now could probably be that great opportunity to use this um period to actually move that are we allowed to do that no not at all it uh, the word return is very important guys that means there was a pre-existing that was your residence if it said move to cool then we can move return means if you live in Joburg and you you went to the family in Limpopo because you thought ah oh, it's going to be better with people um for 21 days now you have to return to Joburg for work. You're allowed to do that once off move, but return. There are um, definitely a, a bit of a broader allowance to move, return, um, not just for essential workers, but there is reference to learners that would be allowed uh, to potentially move to wherever they need to be to continue with their studies. So that is allowed, guys, but it once off thing we're not going to move now to to job to do your work and then every weekend return that's not going to happen um it's a once off move and then you are stuck uh, then you are back stuck in the property that you are returning to so there are um a, a, a few people that are trying to use this and the, the funny question that i'm getting is can i take a chance guys in normal life we can take chances and then when you get caught, you're like, oh, sorry. And a bit of a slap on the wrist and it's done. We're talking six months jail sentence. Mm. If you are now taking a chance and you get caught. I don't know. I don't know. But I know we're too pretty for jail system. But <laughs> I'm, I don't know. Not built, I'm, I'm not built for, for that. I'm, I'm, the, I'm a goody two shoes and I could never actually do something like that. And, and, you know, as you're saying, this is actually one of those questions that even our viewers at home have been asking. We've got one from Lina Harbot who had asked, can we move from one house to another house in the same town? And Linda Alice saying, is it possible to move out? Been residing at a friend's house since March and it seems like moving out won't be allowed so that's quite a common question around uh you know whether we can move to new residents uh and i suppose in this instance we wouldn't be returning to wherever it was that we were um in but actually moving into a new place altogether so essentially that's completely out of the question yes 100 percent out of the question the other question now if a, if you moved in with a family member or friend and you thought it was just for the lockdown period and your staff your house with the glass bowl with the chip in it 
is at another place. Definitely you can return to your house, but you can't move house. And if you've been staying with a friend um, because all your stuff is there, um, you can't take your items and move couches. And seriously, I'm talking about the bowls with the chips. That's what I mean with, that is how you know it's your house. Those mm -hmm. items that you wonder if you're going to get rid of it ever and you won't. Um, when you have to start packing those in boxes, that's moving and that yeah. is not allowed. And that's surprisingly a similar question. Um, and, and I can understand this. So you're a landlord and perhaps you've got a vacant property or a few vacant properties. This question is coming in from Nonto Londi Zungu who asks, my apartment is empty. Can I have a tenant occupying it during that one day once off move? The, they would be an exception. So now I'm talking to, to the landlords uh, and to tenants for that matter. If you are an essential service worker and you have to relocate for work purposes, you will be allowed to obtain a permit from a magistrate. Guys, this is important. The police, the station commander in every police station only has the authority to issue permits for people to move for funeral purposes if it's not a funeral the police can't give you the permit if they do it's an affidavit remember the police can commission any affidavit so can i i'm a commissioner of oaks that doesn't make it a permit the fact that it's an, an affidavit with that affidavit you can approach a magistrate and the magistrate can grant a permit to move. But this is in extraordinary circumstances, a magistrate will not grant such a permit because it's essentially a type of a court order just because you want to move into another place that will not be allowed. So it's only extraordinary circumstances which will definitely be centered around things like health purposes or for essential work purposes. So now actually I want us to stay a little bit longer um, on this movement question and, and I know we, your answer is probably going to stay the same but I want to almost give different scenario, scenarios because I've been seeing a few of them. I've had people also approaching me, you know, asking me certain questions and they still have a little bit of uncertainty. Um, and you've mentioned this, this issue of you know, going to the police station, making an affidavit. I was seeing uh, reports of people making that affidavit because they want to move. And this was already in right now in level five and saying that essentially that affidavit it, is there a permit to move into a new residence? And now we're going to move moving into level four where people might think that perhaps restrictions have eased up slightly. So again, they can just go to the police station and make an affidavit. So essentially what you're saying is that affidavit is not the permit that one needs to move. Because some people are thinking, I can still actually move house. Um, I just need to go to the police station and in the event where I have this affidavit and some of them are even calling that affidavit a permit. So in the event where I have this piece of paper that the police have essentially stamped, then it means that I can move my, my things and go into a new apartment or a new house. So are you saying that that is something that we actually cannot do? Yes, 100%. Remember guys, an affidavit is a simple, it's a document where you record something Thing. And a commission of oaths, oath, wow, my words are not finished for the day. <laughs> the commission of oaths uh, certify that you took an oath to, to say that what you said in that document is the truth. Now, I have seen aff affidavits uh, so much more from people that says, I am transferring my property to you. So you and me say, do you want this property? Yes, cool. We go to the police station, we make an affidavit to say, I am giving my property to you. They will even write on the top of that affidavit, title deed. Okay, the fact that we call something something, and the fact that we, the police then stamps it in their capacity as a commissioner of oaths, doesn't change the fact that that's simply a piece of paper recording something that you believe to be the truth. Yeah. Um, so, unfortunately, guys, that is not a permit. A permit is something that will give you a right to act in a certain way within the limits of the regulations. No permit allowing you to do something that is not allowed in terms of the regulations will be legal as either. So even if you are, for instance, the managing director of your organization, 
the fact that you can give permits for people to do things, those things that they can do may only be in terms of the regulations. Mm -hmm. So somebody that's allowed to issue permits, like I'm allowed to issue permits for my entire team um, because we are level four workers. I can't issue, I can issue a permit for my one attorney that has to return from, um, from Portugal. I can issue the permit for her to cross uh, from one province to another. I can't issue a permit for, for my one secretary that wants to move um, from one house to another this weekend. That, that guy's not going to fly. And, 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 and again, we've got another, you know, slightly technical question around this move. Movement. And this one is coming from Wendy Sankos, who asks, how will the return trip be monitored? Is there a window, is there a moving window period? No, no moving window period. However, there is this one sort move that is allowed. It's not within a specific period. However, the minister last night, um, not during her speech, but the Q&A afterwards, definitely alluded to sort of get your moves done over this long weekend. If you have to move anytime they offer, the regulations doesn't say the once-off move is happening in a specific time period. Uh, but the minister definitely alluded to that. And I would suggest get your moving out of the way as quickly as possible. But it's not a window for any type of moving. It's still just for uh, returning uh, to your place of residence. And of course, there's still another issue um, that comes into effect as far as level four is concerned, and we've already got a question around it, is around um, Regulation 19, which is evictions. Uh, and we've got a question here from Sutugazi who asks, I'd like to know, since a landlord can have an eviction notice ready, when can it be served? Um, does it mean that in June you give a notice to the tenant or you can serve it by the 31st of May? So now we're going to have to start on the term eviction notice because, guys, here's a very important lesson for always. This is not a lockdown thing. This is not a national state of disaster. A person cannot give an eviction notice to another person. The only body that can grant an eviction order is a court. Mm. So we can cancel a lease agreement. That is called a letter of cancellation. That letter can contain something that says, because I've cancelled my lease agreement with you, you are to vacate the property immediately. If somebody's been staying for you with you uh, on a sort of an informal arrangement and you're tired of them, you can give them a letter to say, listen, it's been real. We had a verbal agreement for you to stay here, but I'm a little over it. I am cancelling the right that you had to live here. That is not an eviction notice. It, once again, even if you call it an eviction notice on top of the letter, it doesn't make it an eviction notice. So I had to start there with the answer. Mm. We can commence with eviction proceedings now. I'm obviously very excited about that, uh, being a, an eviction specialist and a firm that pretty much does mostly evictions. Uh, for us to have a moratorium on evictions was a little scary, but uh, we're very happy that we can obtain our orders now. So we can institute eviction proceedings now already. We can even obtain the eviction orders. The eviction orders, however, the execution of those orders with regards to residential property is then stayed. So what that process will look like is you're going to send your tenant a normal letter of demand, giving them the 20 business days in terms of the Consumer Protection Act to remedy their breach. If they don't, you're going to cancel. On cancellation, you have to instruct an attorney to obtain these eviction orders. The, reg the regulation is very clear. Only orders in terms of ESTA and by the extension of Security of Tenure Act and the Prevention of Illegal Evictions from and Unlawful Occupation of Land Act. Only those eviction orders can be obtained at this stage. I'll return to, to commercial evictions just now. but. Yeah. Those evictions can be obtained now. The orders will be obtained, but we hold off on execution. And the court order will read something like the respondent will have to vacate this premises as soon as the lockdown regulations allow for them to vacate. If that person then doesn't vacate, then we can send the sheriff 
to effect the actual eviction. So the eviction notice that she was referring to, I am afraid, is simply a cancellation letter. And, but she can instruct an attorney now to commence with the eviction proceeding. We can even obtain an order for you. And if they don't vacate, we can then have the sheriff evict them. However, we are definitely allowed to obtain commercial eviction orders now, and we are also allowed to execute them already. So it's only the stay on eviction execution is only on residential evictions um, and, the, uh, and not on commercial evictions. If, uh, commercial evictions we will be able to execute, provided that the sheriff has capacity and is willing to, to attend to the executions during lockdown level four. And then, of course, uh, Silna, there's the, the, the last issue of the, the deeds office. I mean, a lot of people were celebrating that the deeds office is going to be open. Um, what are the implications uh, of the deeds office opening and the, the, the operation um, that they'd essentially be able to carry out? So that's, that's also a very interesting thing. Uh, we're getting to learn so much uh, about, uh, about the way people perceive things in this yes. time. Hey? Yeah. Uh, so remember, guys, the deeds office isn't only there for registration of property, also there for endorsements on title deeds, for um, registration of anti-natural contracts, things like that. So the functioning of the deeds office isn't exclusively for transfer. So as much as the deed, a deeds office is functioning, we can't transfer property without a rates clearance certificate. Now, when it comes to rates clearance certificates under level four, we municipal services essential, municipal services are allowed. Now, what is essential municipal services? We do not know at this very second. That will, that's one of the things that will crystallize over the next few days. So if the municipalities say, okay, cool, we do, we do feel that um, rates clearance is an essential service or it's something that the municipalities can do without exposing um, their people and, and obviously uh, other people to a risk of the virus. Then yes, 100%, um, they can issue rates clearance and we can transfer property uh, like we did in February, remember, good times. Um, so, but if they don't, and if we can't get rates clearance, we won't be able to transfer. At the yeah. same time, unfortunately, estate agents aren't allowed to function um, and aren't allowed to trade in, in level four, which will make it a little tricky um, to transfer properties. But when it comes to transfer, I would say, be calm. I don't think all is lost yet uh, for estate agents. I do believe that in the next few days we will get some clarity from the municipalities on rates clearance. If that can happen, we can transfer properties. Estate agents will have to be very creative then on how you're going to do your viewings, how you're going to uh, conclude your agreements. But uh, there will be a few matters that will be able to to go through like that, provided obviously that we can get rates clearance. But other than that, uh, the reason for the deeds office is unfortunately wider than just transfer of property. Um, so I, I, I think we're gonna have to give it some time, uh, maybe just a few days to see exactly what the intention is from government when it comes to, to uh, transfer of properties. There are more questions coming in from our viewers at home, Silna. If you've got any questions, I'm on the line, um, or rather uh, speaking to Silna Stain, who's the Managing Director of SSLR. And we're looking at, uh, tomorrow we'll be having level four lockdown. We're looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly for tenants, uh, landlords, as well as agents, and really trying to make sense of what level four um, means particularly for people in property. So whether you're living in a particular property, whether you're a landlord and you've got different properties that you're managing or an estate agent and trying to understand what you can or cannot do during this period, this is exactly what we're discussing this evening. So you're more than welcome to send through your questions and we'll address them. Now, so another question coming in is a rather interesting one. It's coming from Dural Jafta who asked, I just received an OTP. Any advice for me? What should I look out for? 
since I'm not able to view the property, um, since I'm not able to view the property, what should I, um, and what should I ask the agent to make me more satisfied for the sale? Uh, we're having a virtual meeting tomorrow. Any advice is welcome. Oh, wow, that's a beautiful question. I love it. Yeah. Um, you know what, the truth is, depending on the reason for the purchase. So if your intention is to buy the property, to flip, um, that, you know, if there's a huge disaster somewhere in one of the walls, but your intention is anywhere to do a quick renovation and flip the property, I wouldn't be overly concerned. If it is a property that you want to move into, um, I must say a very thorough virtual inspection. So the seller must walk through with his phone um, on a video call showing you every single corner. The only thing is, um, when it comes to things like, is there any leaking um, taps? Is there any leaking pipes? What I will suggest is potentially for you as the purchaser to do away then with the food stirs clause. So specifically say, let's remove that clause. Let's say you, Mr. Seller, are so convinced that you will disclose every single defect in this property to me that I am willing to not sell this property food to it. That is my best advice for that particular situation because I would be not just reluctant, I think it would be um, very risky, very risky to buy a property food to it that you haven't inspected personally. Uh, because to say everything is working on a virtual uh, inspection, a virtual inspection is one of those things where even if they open the cupboard doors for you, to see the piping in the property, unless you can touch the cupboard and feel if there's any damp or anything in that cupboard, you're not gonna know what you are buying. So definitely get rid of the food stirs clause and make sure the parties agree to that. Remember in an agreement, you can do a lot of things. You can even make this sale subject to a positive inspection after, um, after the lockdown is finished. So you sign the OTP, everybody is happy, but may do a suspensive condition. I've done that um, for, for one of my clients recently. Uh, it's, it's not a very complicated clause, but I suggest that's not a DIY clause. You're welcome to contact um, your attorneys if, if uh, they ask why you are talking to a crazy attorney uh, on a, what day is it? Thursday evening uh, yeah. over a webinar. Uh, be more than welcome to pop me a mail. I'll, I'll obviously help you. Um, uh, with advice like that, I am very sure my cat is going to jump on my <laughs> laptop now. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> so um, it's very um, it's very important to get the right clause in. With the right clauses, you can basically um, get around all these weird and wonderful things that's coming up at this stage. So remove the food stirs clause, make it subject to an actual physical inspection. If there's anything that sits unwell when you do the virtual inspection and you feel a little reluctant, there's not a lot of people right now that, that is necessarily looking into buying properties over virtual inspections. Ask the landlord if you can hold off, well, ask the owner if you can hold off until the end of level four um, to be able to inspect the property. But if you are comfortable with that, that's two provisions that I'm thinking of in an OTP to protect you. I think and that's it's actually, and, and, and you know, so that's actually something that I wanted to ask you around the suspensive clause um, that you could potentially include. Of course, one of them you're saying is um, in after a positive inspection, are inspecting companies right now able to go and inspect? So suppose you can't physically, of course, go to view the property. Are the companies who do inspections, are they considered an essential service? So perhaps you might not want to, phys you might be satisfied with the virtual uh, walkabout, but then you still want the, the, the company that you're going to appoint to do the inspection. Would they be allowed to then go inspect the company for you under level four? I mean, the property for you. Unless there's something very weird with a particular inspection company that does have a permit to function in level four, I can't see anything from the service providers in level four that will allow an inspection company. If they were allowed, that would have made it easier for rental agents as well at this stage yeah. with uh, inspections where a tenant isn't allowed to move, 
but he decides to disregard the law move, we can't do those exit inspections. Uh, so that would have resolved the problem. I even had the question today, um, maintenance guys uh, are level four functioning um, people, some of them majority actually, are they allowed to do the inspection because they are allowed to um, be at the premises? Uh, guys, let's not, you know, let let's the find head ways rates. to break the law, essentially. Let's not find and, ways to loopholes. And let the right people do the right things. I mean, let's not have attorneys do open heart surgery. Um, <laughs> so uh, the maintenance people are amazing, but they don't do inspections for a living, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, so let's actually go back to, 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 to the issue that you've just raised of a tenant who um, sort of goes against what the, the, the law currently says and decides to move out. And this could easily, for example, be a tenant who's, who was already in arrears, because um, I don't see a tenant who's been um, you know, a good tenant, paying regularly, suddenly deciding I'm going to just ditch this and move and not pay um, this month's rental. So let's assume that the person moves out all their, and they somehow manage to move all their things and move to wherever they're going to be going to. How do we then mitigate that, right? So suppose they, um, they're they already for this month, so we're in April, so they already hadn't paid the month, the rental for April. So theoretically, one could argue they've eaten into whatever deposit that they had for this particular month. And you, as, as a landlord, are probably expecting that at the very least, they will try to cover this month's rental. Perhaps you may have already communicated with them about the missed rent, and now you're looking at May, and they actually text you, well, Monday or Tuesday, you get the text, well, I moved out over the weekend. You can find the key at security. What are the legal ways that landlords can then um, sort of mitigate that particular situation? Because the, what can they do firstly with the deposit? Because they still essentially have the deposit with them. What can or can't they do with the deposit given that the rental would have been missed for this month and essentially will, is going to be missed for the following month and the lease agreement is still in effect. So suppose it's only ending September, October, or any other month. What can they legally do given that scenario? Okay, so the, there's multiple questions in, the, in that scenario. So first off, if you have a deposit and the tenant absconds, but you have outstanding rent, the landlord can then take the deposit to the value of the outstanding rent. Yes, we're hoping it's, he's got a bigger deposit than outstanding rent. Um, and he is allowed to do that. In terms of the Rental Housing Act, the act of absconding is deemed to be termination of the lease agreement. So why this is relevant is on that deemed termination when the tenant absconds, the landlord is entitled to then apportion um, the deposit and utilize the deposit money. If the deposit is not enough, or if the deposit was already used during March, April, unfortunately, you can institute proceedings, more than welcome to, to collect the money. Um, I must say, there is a very big chance, obviously, of that judgment being a pretty empty judgment because the tenant that's already owing you that much money, that absconds, I can promise you, you're going to uh, be one of the creditors in line against that tenant. In law, you have a claim. In law, you will get a judgment. Unfortunately, we don't have an ATM somewhere where you stick your judgment in and the money comes out. Uh, but you will be <laughs> successful. Imagine, we should do that. <laughs> so, uh, only, only SARS has an ATM like that. It's called yeah. your own bank account. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's the one, one scenario. The tenant that vacates, no, that's not allowed to. Leave the keys with the security. Very important here, guys. Once again, Rental Housing Act then says that agreement's terminated. So it's cool, use the deposit, but is that a legal handover of possession to give it to the security guard didn't arrange with you? Yes, um, definitely. In terms of, of delivery, he did hand possession back to you. However, the risk of damage to the property the type of damage to the property that the landlord will anyway be responsible for, whose insurance will be covered by that, for instance, the geezer that bursts in the meantime while the premises is standing open, 
that is still the landlord's risk. However, if the security guard then thinks it's going to be so much more convenient to live in a complex instead of commuting back and forth, taking occupation, the tenant that recklessly handed over possession of a premises to a third party, that tenant will then be liable for the damages the landlord suffers because of the security guard that's now living in the property. Mm. And I think, Silna, that's probably a great place, you know, to leave it. I think, are there any other provisions that you'd like our viewers at home to be aware of, given level three, whether they're a tenant or an estate agent or a landlord? You know what, I think the most important thing is, is to appreciate that the rules are actually quite simple. The rules are saying, let's stay inside, let's stay indoors, with a few exceptions. If we stick to the rules, we should be fine. If we don't, we are at risk of six months imprisonment. So it's not like, eh, I don't feel like staying in. I mean, the rules are pretty serious, but the repercussions of not sticking to the rules is really, really serious. And I think it's very important to appreciate that if we understand that, if we don't try to bend the rules or don't try to argue, it's so weird, I've been having um, to bat off arguments the whole day today. And I'm like, I'm not the one that made the rules. I'm just the one that explains what it is. And um, if we appreciate what we hear and what we read and take it as that is unfortunately what our lives are like right now because of um, COVID-19, then it's actually pretty easy um, to, uh, to understand what the rules are saying. So I know I'm saying things that's driving everybody crazy um, because we don't want to hear we're not allowed to move. But unfortunately, that is the reality that, that we are currently in. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Silna. I'm sure it's been quite insightful uh, for many of your viewers at home. And a lot of us you know, have so many questions around these new regulations. And hopefully by the time we get to level three, and many of us are hoping that that's going to be soon. So if we all sort of stay at home and keep up with what level four is going to be, then we'll hopefully in the very near future make it to level three. And we'll also unpack what level three actually means. And of course, we'll wait for government to update us on what is possible and not possible um, during level three. So thank you very much for joining us this evening, Silna. And that is Silna Stein, who's the managing director of SSLR. And we've been unpacking what the implications of the level four lockdown are for or tenants, agents, as well as um, landlords. And of course, that's kicking off tomorrow. So we do hope that you're going to be staying at home and staying safe. And if you have any properties to view, you can always go to www.privateproperty.co.za and some of the properties actually have a virtual tour. So you may not be able to physically go to those apartments, but you can certainly start having uh, viewing the virtual tours. We also have virtual tours available right here on our Facebook page, just to give you a sense of some of the properties that you might want to shortlist for as soon as we're able to go out there. So that's www.privateproperty.co.za. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I've been your host, Zamandu Kumalo. Until Monday, tomorrow is a public holiday. We don't even feel these public holidays because we're stuck at home. But tomorrow is a public holiday, so we'll be back again on Monday evening right here at 7 p.m. Stay home and stay safe. Good evening.